well, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, it seems obvious that uh, few, if any, issues have been subject of more debate within the Christian community today and beyond the broader society than the issue of same-sex relationships. With people of sincerity, intelligence, and good faith on both sides of the issue, but also involving many people of sincerity, intelligence, and good faith who are ambivalent and uncertain, driven in their own minds and souls over the issue. It is a privilege to have with us today a highly respected biblical scholar and theologian who has himself struggled carefully, thoughtfully, and conscientiously with the issue, bound on the one side by a deep reverence for scripture, and on the other by deep sensitivity to the human matters involved. James B. Brownson is the James and Jean Cook Professor of New Testament at Western Theological Seminary in Holland, and he will talk to us about his book, Bible, Gender, Sexuality, and Reframing the Church's Debate on Same-Sex Relationships. After his presentation, um, Jim will welcome your questions, uh, of course, sincere, thoughtful, and questions of good faith. Anyway, thank you, and Jim, you're welcome. Okay, can you hear me okay? I think that's working. Good. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to see folks uh, interested in this book. Uh, I have to admit that, you know, this is not the first book I've published, and I've never quite gotten this sort of response to the other three. Um, and it's, it's, it's a kind of new thing for me uh, I, um, to, to, to engage a topic that is so hot in, in, in the public uh, realm uh, as, as the book comes out. Let me just say a couple of things about some of the major points I'm trying to make in the book, and uh, then I'll be happy to invite your questions about more specific sorts of things. Now, one of the things that I mentioned early in the book, in the first chapter actually, is that I got kind of dragged into this, not necessarily because I wanted to, but because eight years ago, uh, my son, who was at that point 18 years old, uh, told my wife and me that he thought he was gay. And that sent me on a long journey. Uh, interesting, I, I can track all the stages of grief in my life. Um, you know, and, and this is not an ideological issue. It simply is the case that no heterosexual couple dreams for their kids of being gay, right? That, that, that's just not the future that I dreamed for my son. Um, and I had to let go of the future that I had dreamed of and to embrace, at least to figure out a different sort of future to dream of and, and really how I should pray for my son. Um, and that sent me, because I'm an academic, on a long journey of trying to, all right, well, let's, I don't know, look at what the scripture has to say and figure out what I should think about this and spend a lot of time doing that and found my perspective on a number of things changing. Um, and let me highlight three sort of major issues uh, that led to the writing of the book. The first one is this category that I introduced in the very first chapter called moral logic. Now that's not a technical term that's widely used in the field, but it's as good a term as I can find. Um, what I'm really after when I talk about moral logic is simply, it's not enough to ask what, what a text says, you have to ask why the text says what it does. Uh, because there's lots of things that the Bible says that we, that we apply in, in all sorts of nuanced ways. And the example I use in the book is, is Calvin on thou shalt not kill. Because Calvin had to deal with the radical reformers in his day who were saying, what about thou shalt not kill do you not understand? This means that all war is necessarily immoral, and it means that the state should never have the power of the sword. Nobody should kill under any circumstances. Thou shalt not kill. End of discussion, right? That's what the text says. Go and do it. Well, Calvin says, 
eh, it may be a little more nuanced than that. Because when you look at Genesis 9, and when the text says, if someone sheds the blood of a human being, by that, by a human being shall that person's blood be shed, because God created human beings in the image of God. So in other words, the prohibition of murder is grounded in the moral logic that there is this incalculable value placed on every human life because all human beings are in the image of God. And if that's the case, then of course you can't kill human beings, but it's also the case that in some marginal situations, you might have to actually kill some human beings to preserve the lives of more human beings. And understanding the underlying value helps you to make those very challenging, difficult judgments, right? So, uh, understanding why the text says what it does is a big deal. And my own conviction is that the way the debate about same-sex relationships is evolving is there are fundamental disagreements about, uh, about what the Bi why the Bible says what it does about the same-sex relationships it talks about in Leviticus 18 or 20 or Romans 1 or a few other passages. The underlying moral logic, there are different construals of that. So I try to flush that out uh, and reframe the debate in those terms, uh, rather than just what does the Bible say, why does the Bible say what it says, and how does that speak to contemporary committed long-term uh, same-sex relationships. So uh, trying to get at that, that why question is, for me, the central issue. Now that leads to the second uh, sort of major point. Um, I characterize the two positions as traditionalist and revisionist, um, uh, trying to find some relatively neutral way to talk about both of them. But if you look at a variety of traditionalist positions and you say, all right, cut to the chase. What fundamentally is wrong about same-sex relationships? Why are they forbidden? Why does the scripture say no as you read the scripture? Uh, what you find is actually a fairly consistent answer that I try to document in the book, that these relationships violate divinely intended gender complementarity. And so I think you have to think about that. And I have a, my, my first observation about that is that gender complementarity is not really an argument, it's a category. To say that there's some sort of gender complementarity is to say there's some pattern of similarity and difference between the genders that is divinely ordained. But you haven't yet specified, well, what is that pattern? What is similar and what is different? And when you try to flush that out in more detail, what you discover is there, there really are three different sorts of gender complementarity that people who say, the traditionalists who say same-sex relationships are wrong, use. And they're not really all agreeing with each other about what those are. One of them is men should lead, women should submit. Uh, the kind of uh, complementarianism that sees it in terms of the hierarchy of men and women. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, I don't think that that's what scripture normatively teaches. Others, particularly the Catholic tradition, says no, it's not the hierarchy of men and women, it's procreation. Uh, it's the procreative capacity of male and female that defines what this complementarity is. And of course, the Catholic Church says that um, for this, same-sex relationships are wrong for the same reason that contraception is wrong. Because it's not affirming the complementarity of male and female in terms of procreative capacity is resisting that or avoiding that in one way or another. Now, most Protestants don't quite buy that and want to say procreation is an important part of marriage, it's not an essential part of marriage, and therefore the use of contraception um, is, is okay within the context of marriage. Uh, so that one it doesn't have universal assent. So it tends to be the case that the argument shifts to a third one, which is probably best articulated by Robert Gagnon uh, in his sort of classic study on same-sex relationships, uh, which is the fittedness of sexual organs, that male and female organs fit together, and that's what gender complementarity is. Right? But when 
you know, my hypothesis is if that's what gender complementarity is, well then you ought to be able to substantiate that exegetically by actually looking at texts that speak this way. And I observe that you can't find any biblical texts that talk about the fittedness of male and female sexual organs. Not only can you not find biblical texts, what I try to argue is you can't find any texts in the ancient world that talk this way. That this is simply not the kind of conceptual category that people in the ancient world used to think about gender. You find lots of things about procreation, but you can't find sort of this reflection on the fittedness of sexual organs with each other. So I argue that that, that doesn't quite work either if you want something that would have made sense to the original speakers and, and hearers of these texts. So what I suggest is, uh, I don't think that scripture teaches a normative gender complementarity. At least the versions that are out there, I don't think scripture does teach. So unless somebody wants to come up with another one, I think we need to set that aside. Um, and that sort of raises again the question, all right, why then does scripture speak against these relationships? And I devote a great deal of attention to trying to explore the actual moral logic uh, that the biblical texts do, and, and, um, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. So that, that is my fundamental problem with the traditionalist side. I think it posits a moral logic that can't be substantiated both in the ancient world generally and by exegesis of the biblical texts. On the other hand, I also have some gripes with the revisionist side as well. And there, my concern looks something like this, that um, if you look at the way most revisionists say, you know, we need to be more accepting of gay and lesbian couples in the church, they base their argument almost exclusively on the categories of justice and love. Uh, that justice and love requires that we do this. My contention is that justice and love are really important pieces of any kind of ethic on any issue. So they're necessary pieces of a sexual ethic, but they are not sufficient elements of a sexual ethic. And the reason for that is justice and love don't tell us anything about the meaning of sexuality. Right? They, they, they just don't focus on that issue. And if we're going to construct a biblical sexual ethic, we need to talk about the meaning of sex. And I, quite honestly, I think this is why a lot of conservatives have been really nervous about talking about this issue. Uh, because, let's face it, I think most people realize in our culture that our culture is not listening to the church very much when it comes to sex anymore. You just talk to any pastor, I don't care how conservative the church, and just ask how many of the people that you marry now are living together before they come to you. And I don't care who they are, they will say a lot more, right? Um, there's an interesting survey recently about women aged 19 to 29 uh, in, in American culture. And of that group, they identified, all right, how many of them have a significant other that they live with, right? Now you identify that group. Women 19 to 29 who live with a significant other. How many of those women are married to their significant other? 52%. Right? Um, in other words, half of our culture is not living the way the church says you're supposed to live. Okay? Um, now, conservatives get that and say, all right, if we can't listen to what the Bible says about same-sex relationships, you know, how are we going to ever listen to what the Bible says about anything with respect to sexuality? And we're simply giving up the capacity to allow scripture to speak in an informed way to our lives. And so the whole center section of the book um, is really an attempt to try to develop a, a cross-cultural biblical sexual ethic that, that can allow us to talk in a more contemporary context. And what I really focus on here is I look at all the passages where that, that quote Genesis 2, the two shall become one flesh. And my central argument is that that language of one flesh in the Hebrew context is all about kinship. And in many respects, Genesis 2 is about the origin of the fundamental kinship bond from which every other bond, every other kinship bond flows. And so I, what I argue is that the central 
theme of a biblical sexual ethic is that people are not supposed to say with their bodies by uniting sexually what they're not willing or able to say with the rest of their lives by recognizing and living out a lifelong kinship bond. Um, so I think this is the central reason in scripture why promiscuity is so deeply problematic. Um, and there are a variety of other things that I say about that, but um, the, the, point, the larger point here is if we're, going to, if we're going to talk meaningfully about gay and lesbian relationships in the church, we have to have a coherent, exegetically based sexual ethic within which we can talk not only about heterosexual couples and does this, make, does this adequately speak to the way we understand the meaning of heterosexual marriage, but then, all right, if that's the biblical framework, then how can we, how might we possibly think about gay and lesbian relationships within that same uh, biblical framework about the meaning of sexuality? So it really is a, an attempt to, to try to articulate a deeper understanding of the biblical meaning of sexuality within which then we talk, about, we can talk about um, gay and lesbian relationships as well. The last thing I want to say is. Um, uh, the, 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 the next section of the book uh, is actually four chapters devoted to the interpretation of Romans 1, 24 to 27, the sort of central text about gay and lesbian relationships. Um, and my contention is that we're, we're, the only way we're going to get through this is look more carefully at this text rather than ignoring it. So I've devoted four chapters to it. And what I'm doing in those four chapters is trying to identify what I think are four kinds of moral logic, four reasons why whatever the relationships are that Paul is talking about, why he thinks they're wrong. Right? First reason is that they're lustful. He says they're consumed with passion um, and they're lustful. And uh, you know what's what's going on here is I think basically the fact that Jews uh, and Christians in the ancient world had no uh, credence with any notion of sexual orientation. Uh, if you look at the way Jews, who, who particularly who, who write about same-gender relationships, speak of it, they think that same-sex relationships are people who are not satisfied with, same, with, with heterosexual relationships and driven by an increasing thirst for the exotic. Right? Uh, and so uh, it's, it's this insatiability that drives um, homosexuality. And Paul describes it that way, talking about this passion and lust. Um, which raises the question, of course, what do you do with gay and lesbian couples that are trying to discipline their passions by long-term commitments and who have never experienced any kind of desire for someone of the opposite sex? The second one is um, uh, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity. And I think in a New Testament context, impurity is really about motives. There's this move uh, to, to a more interior understanding of what purity and impurity is in the New Testament. Um, so impurity means self-serving motives um, rather than genuinely loving motives. And it seems to me that this makes sense when you realize that most of same-sex relationships in the ancient world were older men with young boys or masters with slaves. They're not mutual relationships. They're not genuinely caring relationships. The younger subordinate exists to serve the needs of the older. Uh, so it's driven simply by self-centered desire. Um, and uh, so uh, these relationships are lustful, they're impure, they're degrading, um, they're shameful. Paul uses the language of honor and shame in Romans 1. And uh, there I think you come up with, you come up against the, the basic ancient understanding of gender that to make a man act like a woman is sort of inherently to degrade the man, right? And so the passive partner is shamed in, in these things. Now, codes of honor and shame change in a variety of different cultures in a variety of ways. Um, but I think whenever sexual relationships are not mutual and one partner is shamed in one way or another, something is deeply wrong. Uh, but are all such relationships necessarily shamed? That's at least the question that I want to raise for further discussion. And then finally, um, these relationships are contrary to nature. And um, this, is, this is a somewhat complicated argument. It's complicated because uh, if you saw the little thing that I posted on the Irvin's blog a few months ago, 
Uh, this is a classic case of the blind men and the elephant, right? Um, that both sides of the argument actually identify relevant pieces of what nature means. Uh, more uh, revisionists say, when, 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 when Paul describes people acting contrary to nature, he's talking about heterosexual people acting out in gay ways. So they're acting against their own sexual orientation. That's what against nature means. And it is true that the ancient understanding of nature is connected to this notion of individual disposition. And that's part of it, but that's not all of it. Um, other people say, they quote 1 Corinthians 11, doesn't nature teach you that it's disgraceful for a man to wear long hair? They say nature is simply a social convention, what, it, what everybody knows, quite, quote, unquote. Um, and that changes over time. Uh, and so what was natural then, what everybody assumed was natural then, isn't necessarily what everybody assumes was natural then. And, you know, that is part of the usage of nature in the ancient world. But then um, traditionalists say, you know, nature is about biology. Um, and that's what's being violated. That's what's contrary to nature. Um, and there's lots of evidence in the ancient world that people did think that way. Particularly when it comes to sex, nature is about procreation. And in fact, for the first 300 years uh, of the church, when Romans 1.26 talks about women who act contrary to nature, the assumption is not that these are lesbian relationships. The assumption is that these are non-reproductive heterosexual relationships, like oral and anal intercourse between a man and a woman. Right? And they're against nature because they're not reproductive. Okay? Um, so what, what I try to argue is that actually the Stoic vision, and I think Paul is appealing to the Stoic vision in Romans 1 because he's trying to make an argument apart from uh, Revelation. The Stoic vision is about the convergence of individual disposition, social consensus, and of natural order. And so the question that I end up raising is, are there ways in which we could perhaps re-envision what that might look like, such a convergence between the natural world. We know some different things about the relationship between same-sex orientation and biology and natural processes now. and um, social consensus and what we know now about individual disposition and sexual orientation. Because one of the things that's emerging with crystal clarity is sexual orientation is highly resistant to change. One of the most striking things that happened in the last year is that Exodus International, the umbrella organization for most traditionalist groups that minister to gay and lesbian people and are trying to persuade them not to be in gay and lesbian relationships, even that organization has taken all of the literature off their website that talks about reparative therapy or changing from gay to straight. And they acknowledge that that does more harm than good. Uh, and so there really is a fairly clear emerging consensus now of the persistence of sexual orientation despite lots of attempts over the last 30 years, highly religiously motivated attempts to help people to change, it just doesn't work. And so we need to think about ethically and morally about this issue in light of that sort of data that we've learned in the last 30 years or so. Now, you could agree with a lot of what I have to say in this book, and you might still have reservations about whether we should talk about marriage, versus civil unions and things like that. I don't really address those issues. You might have a lot of disagreements about whether gay and lesbian people in committed relationships should be ordained or whether this is a kind of concession to human weakness. I think those debates are all still there. And I really don't take a position on those things on this book. And the reason I don't is I think the church has more basic things to talk about, uh, which is basically how we read the biblical text. And what are the assumptions that we bring to it about why the text says what it says. And I think if we talk about those things first, we may have a clearer ground to engage some of the more immediately controversial issues that the church is facing, and perhaps engage that, those issues more constructively than we've been able to in the past. That's the quick 25 minute tour, uh, and I'd be happy to entertain your questions. All right, we are gonna take some questions. Um, two things. If you have not purchased the book yet, it is 40% off in the bookstore. Pick the one up before you leave. And right when we're done here, we'll let Jim sneak through and everyone 
and join us for a brief refreshment afterwards. Um, one story. Uh, Richard Mao was here not long ago, and we had a few people in the crowd that were calling him a Mormon missionary. <laughs> so we're not going to do that kind of thing here. Um, we're going to think about this book. Um, we're going to think about the approach to scripture. And those are the questions that we'd like for you to think through with us. And if you know, Jim can answer them in some way. Yeah, and, and I, I really do, I mean, if, if there are things you want to challenge or push back on, I really want to invite that too. I mean, there, there's no there's no agenda here. I want to hear what you have to say and I want to respond to it. event yesterday. Um, we're, this is the end of our distance learning intensive, and so we have uh, over a hundred of our distance learning students in for a couple of weeks. And um, we did a kind of back and forth. And you know, really what we're trying to do is just sort of model how can people who don't see eye to eye on this have conversations that might be more constructive and that might actually help everyone to learn something. And you know, I think basically, uh, the, the seminary has been a pretty good environment that way. We're not all of one mind on the faculty. Uh, we're certainly not all of one mind in the student body. Uh, but I, I think we work hard to try to create a hospitable environment where people don't feel shamed about saying whatever their concerns are. Uh, and I think we've been pretty good at it. Uh, and that's worked out pretty well. You know, the larger RCA, um, things are still sort of shaking out. Um, uh, this summer synod, this will be a hot topic. I'm actually not going to be at this summer synod, and, and I'm not all sad about that. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, you know, um, I, I get I get lots of uh, email and contacts from, from people thanking me for what I'm doing. I get some emails, people sort of writing and complaining about what I'm doing. So you know, that's I, I knew that writing the book. Uh, that that was going to be the effect. And uh, one of the things that I've had to work on a lot, uh, having written the book, is the spiritual discipline of the relinquishment of anxiety. Uh, I'm not naturally sort of drawn to controversy, and uh, I have to fairly regularly pray the prayer of serenity to distinguish between the things that I can change and the things that I can't, and to trust God for the things that I can't change. Uh, and that, that has become an important part of my life. I'm going to ask a question to which the answer may well just be book, if it will. <laughs> but in your brief crazy, you identified three kinds of normative common therapy that won't launch you think, uh, as a serious reading of the Do you think there is a kind of creational gender common therapy there to be unpacked in some way, or do you think we just have to give up that notion? Um, I, I, th I think it's undoubtedly the case that scripture envisions and talks about and assumes marriage between a man and a woman. This is clearly at the center of God's gracious purpose and needs to be at the center of the way that we think about marriage. Um, 
so the question is not whether gender whether some sort of complementarity of male and female is a normal part of life. Uh, I think it is, and I think it's divinely intended to be a normal part of life. I think one of the questions is, how do we make decisions about how we make exceptions? Right? Um, just to use another example, I think the teaching of Jesus makes it pretty clear that remarriage after divorce is not what God intends. Uh, and yet, sometimes we make exceptions. It just seems the right thing to do. And there's a whole variety of reasons for that. If you haven't read Lou Sneed's article, like The Wideness of the Sea in 1999 Perspectives, he talks about the gay lesbian issue against this sort of background of, of divorce and remarriage. Um, but uh, the question is, not whether heterosexual marriage is normal, it's whether it is exclusively normative and that anything that can't match this in any particular way can't be called, you know, can't be acknowledged in any way, shape, or form, right? And that's the point at which what I'm trying to say is if it really is the case that at the heart of heterosexual marriage, and I'm really acknowledge that that's what we're talking about, if at the heart of this is this relationship between sexuality and kinship, that, that erotic desire is transformed into agopic desire, uh, as, uh, as and, and this is the providence of God, that the, the mean and purpose of sexual desire is to bond us with each other so that we live in long-term relationships. If that's really at the heart of heterosexual marriage, can by analogy we talk about gay and lesbian relationships in that sort of way? So uh, it, it's not as if I'm saying this, this is irrelevant. It's, it's I'm questioning whether it's exclusively normative. And if you define it in biological terms, then it is exclusively normative. If you define it in other terms, it may not be. Do you have a particular hermeneutical model that you're modeling after? It seems like, I've read the book, and it seems like you, you, you go from one point to being uh, traditional exegetical hermeneutical abandoning that halfway through the chapter or something comes in. What, what hermeneutical model do you like uh, Well, it sounds like maybe we need to talk in more detail about specific things there. I mean, um, my hermeneutical model is, um, well, you know, I think first of all, I, I read the Bible as an Orthodox Christian. That is, that the central message of Scripture is that in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we see the culmination of God's saving purpose for the world. And any ethical and moral thinking needs to be looked at within that sort of framework. So, you know, a, a kind of centrally confessional, creedal reading of Scripture is is my approach to Scripture. Um, uh, so that, that's the first thing. You know, the, the second thing is my assumption about this notion of moral logic, that, it's, that if we're, if we're going to know how to apply what the Bible says, particularly in situations that, that have some sort of difficulty in terms of is, how, it's, it's contested one way or another, um, we, need, we need to ask, why does the text say what it says? And, and my hermeneutic says that there are two basic ways. The first and most important way is we need to find other biblical texts that tell us this is why, this is the underlying moral logic, like Genesis 9 and thou shalt not kill. Um, uh, or if, if we can't find those, at least we have to find evidence in the ancient world that that is the operating form of moral logic. Um, and so that, that ends up being a kind of fundamental principle. We have to, you know, the way my particular uh, denomination talks about the, the, the authority of scripture, it says scripture is authoritative in what it intends to teach. Uh, and so getting at what the scripture intends to teach, you have to ask that question, why is it saying what it does? So that's that's my, my core from the beginning. Yeah? It, it seems significant to me that uh, Vice President Dick Cheney was about as far right that she could be on just about every issue except for the gay lesbian one, in which she was quite to the left. And of course, from no coincidence that his daughter uh, is a lesbian. And so, given that that's just kind of a human condition that I've heard described, the, the mind justifies what the heart desires, that those two are linked. My, my, my question to you, to the extent to which you can engage in some psychoanalysis, is if, if instead of um, 
the impetus being your son coming out and being gay. Instead, Erdman had come to you and said, you have an upcoming sabbatical, we'll pay you if you like, you want to you know, spend time on this book, whatever, and, and do it without. So you still have the motivation to do it, but you don't have this personal stake in it. Do you, do you see the book having, would it have come out at the same point? Uh, I have thought a lot about that um, and worried a lot about that, you know, because um, I, I, I'm enough of an academic in my bones that I want to be objective and rational and not be influenced by the subjective factors. Um, so I, I've pondered it a lot. Here's a couple of things that have come to me as I think about it. The first one is, when you're talking about trying to find a different paradigm, a different way to think about gender and sexuality uh, in light of scripture, it takes work. Particularly, uh, you know, I mean, I invested an awful lot of energy uh, in working on this book. And I wouldn't, I don't think I've had the motive to do it. I don't think Erdman's paying me to write it would have done it, quite honestly. Um, uh, what, what happened with me is, you know, at, at a sort of existential level, I had to know how to pray for my son. Um, and and that, that was way down there at the core. And uh, if that meant I needed to pray that he would become straight, I, you know, I was ready to do that um, if, if it meant that I should pray for him to find a long-term relationship. I was willing to pray to do that, but I, had to, I you know, and, and I'm, I'm smart enough parent to realize, you know, this is my 18-year-old son at that point. He's not going to do what I tell him. Um, but, um, but I want to know how to pray because I'm going to do that. Um, and uh, so it, it just took a lot of work. Number one, so. I think sometimes um, uh, sometimes that's the issue. I think a second issue is the, it, this question looks different when you put a human face on it. Um, uh, and, and when you know someone who's gay or lesbian, um, it, it, just, it just starts to look different. And, and different issues tend to rise to the surface. And so the, the, the contours of the question, when you frame the question, become different, I think, when you know someone well who's gay. Um, and that's a uh, that's a second um, uh, a second set of issues as well. The third issue for me was I I kind of hit a wall with my own denomination's position when I was trying to apply it to my son. Um, you know, there, there are two papers that the Reformed Church in America has written on this issue, the 78 and the 79 reports. The 78 report basically says homosexual behavior is wrong. The 79 report basically says 78 is true, but we ought not to oppress people who have a, who have a same sex orientation. Nothing, nothing morally wrong with being gay. You just shouldn't act on it. Well, my son, at 18, wasn't in a relationship, wasn't sexually active. He was just trying to understand how he operates emotionally. And I may not be the greatest parent in the world, but I realized pretty quickly, if I say to him, Will, it's okay for you to be gay, you just can't act on it. What I'm really saying to him is, it's not okay for you to be gay. And, and I was going to be sending him a powerful double message. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm savvy enough that I didn't do that. <laughs> you know? I said, well, there's a lot of things I don't understand about what you're going through, um, and I'll be praying for you, but I want you to know I love you. And that, that was my first response. Um, but it, it was actually having a son and trying to think through the traditional position of the Reformed Church, and it just didn't work. And, and so I, you know, I, I just felt stuck at that point. I mean, I, I got to go back and figure this out. So it, it's a combination of those things that, that led me to change my view. On the other hand, I, I try to say this at multiple points in the book. I'm trying to make exegetical arguments that can be part of public debate. And, and if it simply is my experience tells me this, 
that's not enough. I think we have to find the justice in the text. A good follow-up. Yeah. I, I appreciate everything you have to say, and resonates deeply within me, I agree with it. On the other hand, I could imagine that Harold Kushner, Rabbi Kushner, wrote, when bad things happen to good people, were up there. His answer could almost be identical, that he has this 14-year-old son who died after a life of agony, and he had to wrestle with what this meaning was. So he came up with his, of course, book was nearly as uh, scholarly as yours, but the attempt was the same, to try to make, make meaning out of it. Yeah, what and kind of a discussion would you have with him? Because obviously he, he did the same thing, but I imagine he came off at the point that you would make this well, and, and I, I think ultimately, well, let me back up a minute. I think my hope and prayer for the church is 30 or 40 years from now, when we sort of get through this in whatever way we're going to get through it, and resolve this in whatever way the church resolves it, without any prejudice about even which way we're going to do it. But when it's resolved, my, my hope and prayer is that Christians 30 or 40 years from now will look back and will say, you know, we understand the biblical text more deeply now than we did then. Um, and, and, and if sort of jarring, incongruent experience don't actually lead to a more faithful reading of the biblical text, then we're into a different ballpark. My job as a New Testament scholar is to help the church read the New Testament more faithfully. And I, I'm willing to, to put my scholarship on the line and say, don't just answer this in terms of whether this makes a meaning that works for me. Let's talk about whether this is a more faithful reading of the biblical text. And ultimately, I think that's the only thing that matters. Thank you. I want to thank you uh, on behalf of a lot of us for engaging the conversation the way you have. I think it's a, a real addition for us. And I think it's going to open up a good conversation. The question I have is not directly attended to in the book, but I know I think about it a lot. And that is, how do you, how do you relate same-sex longings with the whole question of the fall? In other words, how does that play in your thinking and conversation about this? Because it's very, very loaded in many ways. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, well, first of all, first of all, let's talk about heterosexual longing, and then I'll move to same-sex longing. Um, heterosexual longing is affected by the fall, and heterosexual desires and heterosexual relationships need to be redeemed. And there's a lot of ink that gets spilled in the New Testament about trying to redeem them. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think um, all sexuality needs to be redeemed. Um, now, the question is whether same-sex desire is redeemable or not, right? Or whether it is sort of inherently a product of the fall, and the only way you can redeem it is to leave it behind. Um, and, you know, the, but this has to do again with the question of why is same-sex desire wrong? What's wrong about it, right? And if it's marked by excessive desire and self-centeredness and all these other things, then such relationships that are not marked by excessive desire and self-centeredness and all of these other things might be signs that such a relationship is redeemable. Uh, if, on the other hand, what's wrong about them is that the body parts aren't fitting together properly, then, then it's, it's not redeemable. Um, and and it's, you know, the only redemptive process is simply to avoid it. Um, and so that's why this question of why is it wrong becomes a, a really important one. Uh, because it, it really, uh, it's critical to identifying what a redemptive path is like. But it does seem to me, you know, I don't know how many of you know gay and lesbian, Christian gay and lesbian couples who have lived together a while. I, I know some. And I, I see in a number of them just a remarkable amount of fruit of the spirit. You know, uh, the sorts of things that, 
seem to suggest that the Holy Spirit actually might be at work in these relationships. And that seems to me to be also part of the data that, uh, that we need to think about in this regard. I want to say thank you for doing this. I was wondering, um, with Romans 1, if you could speak on that a little bit. The way I read it, it looks like being gay or lesbian is a reaction to um, turning your back on God. And when I knew I was gay when I was a little boy, I hadn't had a chance to turn my back on God. So, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I talk about to some extent in the book, uh, there's some very interesting suggestions that what Paul may be talking about in Romans 1, using somewhat guarded speech, because he's writing, after all, to Rome, uh, is the former emperor Gaius Caligula, who was probably the most infamous emperor, um, you know, who would take female, take women for out from out of banquets, rape them in a side room, and then come back and comment on their performance. And he liked to swing both ways with men and women, and all sorts of strange stuff. Um, and Caligula was actually murdered by one of his guards by being stabbed through the genitals, uh, a rather uh, striking way that some commentators think may well be what Paul is talking about in that somewhat cryptic line that nobody knows quite what to do with at the end of Romans 127, receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their error. Uh, yeah, but, but the problem is, if it's AIDS, nobody in the ancient world would have understood it, right? Because, you know, you know my, my fundamental principle of interpretation is you have to find a, a, a way to read this text that would have made sense to the original readers, uh, and that wouldn't have. Uh, this would have, right? Um, so if that's the case, what Paul is talking about there is a kind of slam dunk example of human depravity. I mean, Caligula was just the evidence of everything that goes wrong with human life. Um, and, uh, you know, to talk about sin sinners as foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless at the end of that chapter, this is Caligula in spades, right? Um, so, it seems to me that the rhetoric of Romans 1 requires that this is not a marginal sort of nuanced situation. This is a slam dunk. And that's why I, I'm inclined to think that it's a reference to Caligula. And we ought not to use this as, uh, as a more nuanced sort of discussion. There's the mic. Oh. Yeah, one back here. Then. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, when I was listening to that, it seems to be uh, talking about subjects that we have difficulty talking about even about heterosexuality, that number one, it comes down to our whole understanding of scripture, how it came to be. And I love when you did those parallels with Paul slam dunk, but some people just, they, they see, we all see it differently. So I, I just comment on that. Now, the way we come out with how scripture came together seems to indicate a lot. And the other, I just wanted to put on that, is how do we do exegesis in sort of a disembodied sort of way anyway? I don't know how we can separate from experience. I think a lot of times we think we do, and I think you were alluding to that. Uh, it, it's, if it's not our experience, we haven't had experience with people, and some people don't like to hear that argument. And we try to write exegesis or do our exegesis about not even being among people who are different from us. I don't know how we can do it the right way to begin with. Yeah, well, you know, certainly, not just your son, but yeah. Yeah. certainly, you know, experience poses questions for exegesis. You know, I, I think a classic example of this is the 19th century and the slavery issue, or, or the 20th century and the issue of women leadership. I think both of those, you know, like, let's take the 20th century. When I came to seminary, I didn't think that women should be in leadership. And within about a semester, I got to know the women who were part of my class. And it just seemed like, this is stupid, you know? <laughs> These women are gifted, they're good, you know? What, and, and, and so I had to go back and read the text because my experience wasn't, that's what forced me to reread the text. And, and you know, I, I think you can make strong exegetical biblical arguments um, that scripture does confirm that. Um, but again, 
it was the sort of jarring of experience that made me go back and try to make sense of that. So, you know, ultimately I think experience has to bring us back to the text. And ultimately we have to do a better reading of the text. And if we're just, if we're just saying, well, this is my experience, you know, nuts with the text. I mean, that's a contemporary argument, it's not a Christian argument. Up here. Somebody got the mic up here? You want to bring it up? Uh, I can do it. Okay, go ahead. I'm kind of like Whitfield. I don't need the microphone. All right. Um, my wife's brother has been in a same-sex relationship for several years. And when he told us years ago, at first I reacted, uh, how could you do such a thing? Hello. But we have accepted him and his partner. We love them, you know, dearly and deeply, although we disagree with the lifestyle. So when I'm asking him how he prove this biblically. He always gives the example of Jonathan and David, where it says Jonathan loved David more than any man. Can you quote, can you, I'm sure you've worked for that passage. If that's not, I've not read the book. Yeah. Can you give some insight right. to us? Well, that? I don't think there's any biblical evidence that there's any sexual relationship between Jonathan and David. You know, I mean, you might infer that, but I don't think you can, you can find direct biblical evidence of that. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm less inclined to think that that, that sort of settles the issue. Uh, I, I do think, I, I mean, what, I, what the assumptions are in the book is we have to, we have to come to a deep understanding of, of what's the biblical vision for sexuality. Um, and then, how can we talk about gay and lesbian relationships in that light, right? Um, and what I've, and, and, and that's really what I'm trying to do in the book. On the other hand, I do think that, you know, a lot of gay and lesbian couples experience and probe levels of intimacy and friendship between men that other other men don't probe in exactly the same way, and that they would look to David and Jonathan as sort of biblical models for what it means to have a really really close bond relationship between two men, quite apart from sexuality, and you talk to any gay or lesbian couples and they're living together is a lot more than having sex together, just as my living with my life is a lot more than when we have sex together, you know, uh, it's carving out a whole way of being together. And that gay couples would look to relationships like that as at least something of a model um, for what it means to be in a particularly close and committed relationship. You know, that makes sense. Uh, but I, I don't think that's the place where you go to justify uh, uh, a sexual ethic on this issue. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Somebody wants to make it a doozy. Who is it? <laughs> Got one back there. I heard you give big picture stuff and some small picture stuff with the text, for example, the text that you stop and how it goes to the and so on. And could it be on these ethical issues, this goes against the people, uh, statements that Paul was not always consistent. Uh, so, on the one hand, we're going to the church, he uh, uh, offered models of what it is, in other cases, the skittish uh, in certain passages. Why not here? Why not on the issue of slavery? You know, the Philemon is a perfect template for the undoing of slavery. And yet, there's ethics in the New Testament that maintain this type of what was going on. Uh, and the way we navigate it through it historically is to try to understand the, so the current description and the kind of connection where it's going. Uh, and if you chart scripture from beginning to end, you never you never think it will wind up with these pieces that don't need to anymore. So it's not a build up. Um, yeah, I, I didn't quite hear the last sentence there uh, entirely. Can, can you just repeat that last sentence? The last that sentence says, if you look at the scripture more broadly on almost any issue, you're going to find texts that don't quite be the right angles or right thing, that right. make nice and important. Uh, whether you can trace that through a system that wants for gradual revelation or different ethics and so on, all sorts of ways of the church trying to come to terms with this. Book. But I, I, growing older, becoming more and more comfortable that Paul is a human being and he's trying to make the best of it. And he has deep principles that 
voluntarily at the rates of buying it, and the circumstances may be nice to be careful enough that they not always fit in terms of uh, making all these texts harmonize the same as tightly as we like to. Yeah, you know, I, I do think that part of, certainly part of the whole creedal tradition of the church and part of any interpretive uh, task for reading scripture is to differentiate between central and peripheral sort of themes and kind of focal points of scripture. And uh, that, that's, I think, one of the ways to do that. And, and there are debates about that, but those are really good and important debates that I think we need to have um, about the things around which there's more variation. Um, I also um, I also operate with the basic assumption that for Paul the core conviction is that in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus we see what God is up to for the whole world. That's that's what he knows. I don't think there's any variation or change on that. Now. How all that spins itself out into how we live, you know, different New Testament books sort of work on different angles of it, emphasize different dimensions of it. Sometimes out at the periphery they say different things that I think oftentimes are a result of different contexts that they're addressing that are asking different sorts of questions. All of that stuff happens. But uh, I think a big part of the interpretive task is to understand how that central message is being contextualized in, in a variety of contexts. And I think that helps to sort out what some of these variations are. And part of what I've tried to suggest with respect to Romans 1 is at least if we if we envision Caligula here uh, as what's going to come to the reader's mind and what Paul is getting at, um, that gives a very different sort of read on what's going on here. All right. Thank you, Jim.